Okay. Um, welcome to the School of Journalism, Media and Culture um, and the 2024 Martial Arts Studies Conference. I am absolutely thrilled to have you all here. Um, I really look forward to sharing all the ideas and research and arguments and insights that's going to happen over the next couple of days. Um, this is our ninth almost annual conference. Um, we skipped a year in 2021 because even though the pandemic was kind of, kind of melting away, there were still too many travel restrictions. Um, and I'm not big on formal introductions, but I felt that I should try to say something more substantial than I normally do, which tends to be like, hello, let's go, let's just, let's just do it. Um, so I thought I'd put in a bit of effort um, because to me, this conference is just about the biggest event of my year. So um, I want to try and do something. I thought I'd try and compose a proper formal introduction and I thought it would be about the origins, the history and the development of martial arts studies. Um, I started to do this, but it immediately became a kind of high-level theoretical reflection on the field, as a field, and on our practices. Um, and I also couldn't help weaving in reflections on academic theory and practice with reflections on martial arts theory and practice. So... Um, so instead of a welcome speech, I decided to give you a bit of a workout, um, or at least a warm-up. Um, so what I'll do is I'll give you the warm-up, about 20 minutes of warm-up, and then I'll say more about the session that will follow, and then I will shut up. Um, so, seatbelts on. Um, at times like these, uh, I find myself becoming preoccupied with the meta-level or indeed metaphysical question of what martial arts studies is. This is a preoccupation that many of the thinkers, philosophers and theorists that I admire would immediately pounce on and diagnose as wrong-headed, misguided or at least symptomatic of how much I'm ensnared in old Western ways of thinking. It's, it's not one thing, they would say. It's a discursive formation, an assemblage, an interdisciplinary nexus. There are better questions, they might say. What are the fantasies and desires that drive it? What are its ethico-political orientations? Of what cultural, economic, ethical or political forces and relations is it an academic expression? What are its relations and effects? What are its social, cultural and institutional interventions? This is part of why I like the language of cultural theory because it gives me vocabularies and concepts, and thereby different paradigms through which to find ways to conceptualise and express, even if only for myself, what is going on. True, cultural theory is a specialist and technical language game, and one that many people have often said is disconnected from reality, internally facing, self-obsessed and exclusive, or indeed exclusionary. And I accept all of that which is why I always try to translate from the language I think in into terms, concepts, examples and analogies that will help my students or, God help them, my friends, get what I'm trying to say. And even as I'm doing this, there are other programmes running in the background in my head that are thinking about and theorising what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And this is my affliction. But as for the ontological, epistemological or bad metaphysical question of what martial arts studies is, I have to say that I don't think it is a bad or wrong question to pursue, as long as you're fully aware of the significance of the post-structuralist deconstruction and reconfiguration of all questions of identity. Put differently, if you pursue the question of what metaphysics would call the being of the entity, without knowing that this is really just an exercise that should teach you about why identity is never unitary and arguably therefore never really fixed, stable or indeed possible as such, then you are making a mistake as grave as thinking that the formalised and highly circumscribed drills you may do in your martial arts classes are fighting, or that the lineage or pedigree you've been taught about your ancient style is its actual history. They are not which doesn't mean you shouldn't do them. 
just know what they are, or rather, know what they aren't. Put differently, know what they're for. What is to be learned in these exercises, whether that be trying to answer the question of what something is, or trying to master Tai Chi push hands, or an impressive triple kick combination, or a takedown or sweep, and so on. The being of the entity, like the pedagogical drill, is relational, contextual, meaningful only within a field, a practice, a discourse, part of an assemblage of material, institutional, technological and ideological conditions. Change these and it changes. One thing moves, everything moves. This is all worth knowing. It's of immeasurable significance. In studies of martial arts history, movement and institutionalization, we see examples of such change time and time again. Much of the research we read, hear and conduct reveals this and its significance. Cultural theory helps us to find vocabularies to grasp all of this. Most famous, perhaps, is Bourdieuian field theory. Most infamous, perhaps, is Lyotard's postmodern appropriation of Wittgenstein to re-theorize social reality as paralogy or separated language games. We also have post-structuralist discourse theory, actor network theory, assemblage theory, the Brian Masumi kind of affect theory, and so on. These are all good options. There are more. And they all enable us to conceptualize relationality very well. However, they all also have their limitations, their blind spots. Put differently, if all of these different approaches to understanding the being of the entity enable us to understand that everything about, uh, understand that everything about what something is and does is effectively relational, this does not mean that they all say or show or enable us to see and think the same things. Quite the contrary, they are each organized by different concept metaphors that generate different ways of seeing. To illustrate what I mean, let's introduce an example. Let's think about something that is clear and simple, something we can all imagine. How about a stick? A staff? Think about a staff, a long staff, a quarter staff, a bow staff, a joe staff, a lovely, smooth, hardwood staff. Imagine grasping it in your hands. Imagine the feel of it, its weight, its finish. That's our example right there, a lovely long stick. Now to return to our theories, all of the above theories and many more besides would be able to make sense of the stick. All would know that sometimes a stick is just a stick, but not when it becomes a staff. Even before it becomes a staff, even when it is just a stick, as soon as you pick it up and find a use for it, then it becomes part of something, a discursive field, say. But now, let's look at it through the eyes of some different theories. Bourdieuian theory first, the one where the term cultural capital comes from. Everybody knows about cultural capital. But not as many people remember that something only gains capital within and entirely in relation to a field of practice. Through the eyes of this theory, what is relevant about the stick and its user is how good they both are at what they do, or how cool they look to others in the same field. Ultimately, this paradigm is kitted up to work out where cultural values come from and how they interact. This is what it looks for and this is what it sees. It's similar in this respect to Lyotardian or Wittgensteinian language game theory, assemblage theory, and post-structuralist discourse theory. But is that all there is? What do such paradigms not see? A sort of Deleuzean approach was elaborated almost a quarter of a century ago by Brian Masumi. In one case study, he broke down the effective dimensions of a football game. What happens, he asked, from the moment you create two goals, two teams, and have them compete to get one ball through their opponent's goal? He notes immediate tension, variable intensities, passions, points of focus, reorganization of bodily activities, skills, the transformation of regions and areas, both of the physical event space and of people's bodies, what they do with them, how they interact, the status of the rules, the agency of the referee, the feedback loops and intensifications of input and output of the assembled spectators, the ways that television cameras move these intensities into different spaces like domestic homes, and the effects this has within them, and so on. 
It's a great chapter, chapter three of Parables for the Virtual, with an endorsement on the back cover by Megan Morris. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think my stick is a better example. For a start, it's non-dualistic or non-binary. Football is binary and hence not very Deleuzean in itself. But me and my stick are non-binary. Just as you and your stick are non-binary, we pick up the stick, it becomes part of us. Prosthetic in the first instance, but not for long. We grasp and squeeze, feel the muscles in our forearms. We swing it or thrust it and pull it feeling our balance change, our posture, our stance, our gait. Fantasies enter our head, speculations. These range from imagine if, to this must be like, to I am exactly like, and so on. We may imagine, this must be how they fought in ancient China. Or, I bet Robin Hood did this to beat little John. Or we may wager, hey, if I train with this, I'll get really hench. I could go on. Thinking about the microdynamics of such complex scenarios could generate ever-unfolding observations and insights. By the same token, Bordeauxian or post-structuralist kinds of discourse analysis basically run out of steam pretty quickly. They provide no vocabulary for the subtleties and complexities of what is actually going on within the practice, other than, other than matters of who holds power in relation to what, and perhaps what the belief systems are and the ideologies and so on which is not to say they could not be coaxed in this kind of direction. Affect theorist Lauren Berlant argued in her book Cruel Optimism that one reason she found affect study to be so important was precisely because it provided an expansion of the critical study of power and ideology into new realms, embodied realms, the inner workings of techniques, of our interactions with real world things like sticks, but to be clear, there's no opposition between such paradigms. Their differences are often more like degrees of zooming in and zooming out, or code switching for different social contexts. Of course, I don't mean all paradigms. I'm thinking mainly of the ones that I know, which populate and punctuate the realms of the arts, humanities, and social sciences. There are paradigms of which I know nothing. But there's no opposition between, say, Deleuzean, Masumian, Laclauian, Deridian, Foucauldian, Butler Butlerian, Berlantian, or Bourdieuian approaches. This is so even, that, even though there are, of course, many differences, and even though these named individuals were often highly critical of each other. This is because they too are not fixed and static entities, independent of each other, with only internal essences. No. They are part of a field. But what is a field? Surely we encounter the same problem of identity here. Indeed we do, but it seems easier to conceptualise a field as partial, multiple and heterogeneous, an incomplete and fluctuating matter of interacting elements, than it is for us to conceptualise the things we say are in that field in the same way. We know that the field has no identity or properties without the stuff that makes it up. The tricky matter is the flip side of this coin. The things that make up the field have no identity other than within, as, through and in relation to it. The field and its components are mutually constitutive and reciprocally reinforcing. Does this mean they're all just made up? In a way, yes, but only in the way that all things are just basically made up. Or rather, instead of saying made up, let's be more precise and just say made. Full stop, period. All discourses are made. That does not mean false. To clarify, another example. I am hugely interested in what anthropologists sometimes call portable practices, micro-exercise routines, little packages of exercise snacks, things you can do in, say, 10 to 15 minutes a day, one example of a portable practice would be the Chinese Qigong or Qigong adjacent practice of the Baduan Jin, eight distinct stretch relax exercises that are each performed eight times. You can do the whole routine comfortably inside 10 minutes. Another example would be a set of daily exercise, exercises devised by J.P. Muller in Europe in the early 20th century named My System or The System. These are interesting cases both in their own rights and as points of comparison. Both are constructions, i.e. they are made up, 
Both have different theories subtending and animating them, and they each contain some comparable, if not absolutely identical, movements or exercises. For instance, each has comparable twisting exercises. Are these twists the same? Yes and no. Both are twisting the torso in similar ways. Both are articulated on similar principles of moderation. Muller held that to be able to hit peak athletic performance when needed, you do not need to push to that point all the time. You just need to maintain your body's basic physical capacities. This is not a world away from the tacit or explicit theory of the value of the Bad Wan Jin. Indeed, Muller's outlook seems more aligned with the approach of the Chinese tendon-changing classic than with late 20th century approaches to athleticism and healthism. And yet, Baduan Jin and Qigong are explicitly organised by meridian theory and notions such as Qi. This means that the theory of what one is doing when doing, say, the same twist is different in each discursive field. Muscles and tendons, anatomies and biologies are different in each. Ultimately, what this suggests is that unlike a stick, which is just a stick, until picked up and used or played with or thought about functionally, a torso twist is never just a torso twist. What is twisted and why it should be twisted depend very much on a theory that animates a shared discourse or a field. What we make of this fact depends on which theory, paradigm, lens or values we use to think about it. The obvious knee-jerk polemical orientation is right versus wrong. One theory must be right and the other wrong, right? Wrong. Well, maybe. Or maybe we'll never be able to verify or adjudicate from a universally agreed position precisely because there is no ontological and epistemological agreement. But what we can verify is that the meanings of both activity and entity are determined by a field of practice a la Bourdieu or Le Clau and Mouffe. Orientations have tendencies. In his book Qigong Fever, David Palmer argues that the febrile discourse about qi that sprang up in China during the second half of the 20th century was based on a vitalist and animist theory of underlying and interacting cosmic forces. This led, and arguably can still lead, Qigong practitioners away from social institutions of all kinds and towards a kind of field of inherently anti-institutional mysticism. In this realm, doing the Bad Wan Jin easily becomes understood as communing with nature or the forces of the universe. By contrast, Muller's system makes no reference to extra-human forces and is more aligned with a kind of Protestant aversion to sloth and gluttony. It can be connected with the muscular Christianity movement that spawned such institutions as the YMCA. There's a lot to say about all of this. I was going to give a paper called Deorientalizing the Curriculum that would deal with the crossovers and differences in play here. However, that will have to wait. Instead, all I want to do here is point out that different theoretical approaches would make very different things of these examples. For instance, a classic Marxian paradigm might evaluate these as two practices, as they exist today, that illustrate macro-ideologies, the group-taught, standardised and state-institutionalised Badwan Jin being an instance of socialist or communist collectivism, or as it overflows these bounds, as becoming a form of ostensibly alternative lifestyle orientalism versus the entrepreneurially marketed and individually chosen system of Muller being understood as an example of some kind of manifestation of capitalist or today neoliberalist ideology. Other theories would make other things with this compare and contrast exercise. There is, you'll be pleased to hear, no time left to work through what other academic paradigms might make of each or both practices. Instead, it is time for me to conclude. And a decent conclusion should remind us of where we started, where we've just been, and why. I began by saying that occasions like these always make me feel compelled to ask ontological or metaphysical questions. What is martial arts studies? Others spend a lot of time asking, what is or are martial arts? 
I ask such questions too, of course. What I've tried to do here is to suggest that we cannot adequately answer any supposedly simple and direct question about the being of any entity without really trying to engage seriously with both philosophical questions about existence and theoretical questions about identity, at the very least. It might sound to some like I'm advocating the wholesale adoption of affect theory as the master paradigm of martial arts studies. Others might hear what I've said as amounting to my advocating the wholesale adoption of autoethnography as the only approach to martial arts studies. Both of these, affect theory and autoethnography, would each in their own way tend to insist that you cannot know something unless you know how it feels. Only by doing the same stretches in different paradigms can you know how and why they may be lived as different, just as something that looks visually like the equivalent movement in, say, Tai Chi and Judo, such as Tai Chi's brush and push to needle at sea bottom, and Judo's uchi mata, uh, require a more intimate encounter to be understood in detail. Sometimes the same goes for affect theory and autoethnography. These can be very different worlds, not necessarily, but often. Two abbreviations that circulate in martial arts discourse are MMA and TMA. Mixed martial arts and traditional martial arts. Back at our first martial arts studies conference in 2015, a young Zixt Wetzler proposed that what martial arts studies needs is MMA, mixed methodological approaches. I agree entirely, but what I want to add, uh, but I want to add that we must recognise the irreducible place of TMA, theoretical martial arts. When we think about what they are, we theorise. When we devise methodologies, we theorise. When we grasp a stick or swing a staff, we become theory embodied. When we stretch or spar or roll, we are our theories sensorially. There is no opposition between theory and practice. Any practice is an embodied or materialised theory. There's no opposition between MMA and TMA. All are living theories. We love martial arts like we love martial arts studies because we love living theory. So now, as promised, I will shut up and I'll hand over to the panellists. So thank you very much. <laughs>